Your research focuses on processes that control plate tectonics, continental collision, mountain building, deformation of the crust and upper mantle. And more recently, you've been working in the Mediterranean area, in the Himalayas. And today's presentation, you will put the Himalaya te tectonics into this area and plate tectonics. We'll try. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and congratulations to Peter, for whom we're all here. And I actually first met Peter at MIT when um, I was uh, not even yet a graduate student. I was an undergraduate, and I didn't quite realize he was a professor because he was mainly uh, running around talking about doing hacks on other people, these kinds of... Um, and other people were doing them to Peter, so it took me a while to realize that this dynamic young man was actually um, on the faculty at MIT. And, um, of course, I quickly learned um, uh, otherwise. One of the first papers I read as a geologist was work that Peter did with Paul Tepanye on looking at the deformation of the Tibetan region and interpreting that as a broad deformation zone resulting from the collision of India and Eurasia. And actually, in 1984, the first time that I was in the field in Tibet was with Peter and Pei Zhen, who just spoke, and Clark Birchfield up here in the northeast corner of the plateau. Since that time, I've worked for about 20 years in the central and eastern plateau, but what I'm going to talk to you about today, although it encompasses some elements of the plateau, is more about things that have happened along uh, the Himalayan front, some recent work that I'm doing with um, Ali Yagutz at uh, MIT, and um, it's more exciting for me. Um, at this point to talk about something, uh, something new. So as everyone in the audience here knows, India um, started its long trek northward across the Tethys Ocean um, from its position as part of the Gondwana uh, supercontinent. And um, about 130 to 120 million years ago, India rifted off of Gondwana and uh, traveled north to collide uh, with Eurasia sometime around 50 million years ago. Now, if we look at a, um, a velocity diagram of the a relative movement of India and Eurasia, and this relates directly to what Joanne Stock was talking about earlier, uh, we see that it had relatively slow motions um, for the first part of its um, journey away from Gondwana land. And these yellow stars are actually data constrained by paleomagnetic latitudes. It's not very accurate. There's a lot of uncertainty, but um, it's the only thing we have for that time period. But uh, later on, we have um, constraints on India-Eurasia motion, both from seafloor reconstructions doing plate circuits from India to Eurasia, which are the stars... Um, the black and white stars here, which are from Copley et al. and Molnar and Stock. And then on top of that, I've also plotted uh, direct data for opening of the Indian Ocean from Steve Candy, which basically plots right along with the um, India-Eurasia um, motion because um, uh, Antarctica and Eurasia were relatively stationary uh, at that period of time. So all this data agree uh, pretty well, although there's quite a bit of scatter uh, in the data. <laughs> And so what this is normally interpreted as is, of course, this very rapid motion of India due to the subduction uh, to the north, and then the rapid decrease in motion at about, or rate at about 50 million years as due to the India-Eurasia collision, which is basically right here um, where this uh, red line is, or at least this has been the traditional uh, interpretation of this data. Now, in looking at this, something that people are beginning to wrestle with is that these rates are extremely high. So if you look at sort of the fastest rates of long-term plate convergence that we see across single subduction zones today, they're in the vicinity of about 80 millimeters per year. If you look, for example, at the South American Andes or at the Western Pacific, the rates are in about this ballpark. Yet the rates of convergence that we see between India and Eurasia are nearly twice that high, or at least 70% as high, possibly um, possibly higher during this uh, 30 million year time frame or so. So one of the questions is how does one do this? Now one of the recent models that's been proposed uh, by Steve Candy and Dave, Dave Stegman is that the eruption of the Deccan traps associated with the reunion plume coming in when India is right about in this position here at about 67 uh, million years ago is responsible for essentially both weakening the um, mantle, lowering the viscosity uh, beneath India, as well as causing uplift and India sort of surfs forward on this lubricated uh, mantle to go 
much faster than present day motions. Now, if you look at where this fits actually within uh, the time frame here, you can see here's the age, whoops, wrong button. You, Go back. Here's the age of eruption of the re, of the um, Deccan traps here. So India is already beginning to go quite quickly before that, and then that um, r rapid motion persists for more than 20 million years after the um, eruption of the Deccan traps. Some people, including um, Bernard Steinberger, also calculated that this increase in rate here, only about uh, something of the order of 40 millimeters per year, might be due to the um, proposed effects of the uh, reunion plume. So what I'd like to do today is to propose, um, as part of my story of the Himalaya, a different mechanism for this very rapid convergence and tie it into the regional paleogeography uh, as well as the mantle uh, dynamics. So we start here with an image stolen from uh, Google Earth, basically, of the Himalayan belt here. And you can also see um, the, its continuation eastward into Indonesia, also westward through Pakistan, Oman, and all up into the um, Alpine chain here. So this is a picture that most of you have seen something like before. This is the uh, Lhasa Gandhizi arc in here. It's the Andean uh, magmatic arc that was erupted on the southern margin of Eurasia prior to and somewhat during the collision of India with Eurasia. So this really marks nearly the southernmost edge of Eurasia. Now, uh, something else that we've heard about already today, and we'll hear about more from Jean-Pierre Berg, is that there is another arc, which sits in here, the ladakh kohistan arc, which is not an Andean arc. This is an intra-oceanic arc. So this represents an arc formed at a subduction zone, a uh, north-dipping subduction zone, which sat between India and Eurasia in the western Himalaya. Now, if you look closely, so here's a, here's a blow up of this region down here, you see that south of the uh, Lhasa Gandhizi arc, and in fact south of the um, suture between India and Eurasia, is not only the Kohistan Ladakh magmatic arc, but also a whole string of ophiolites, which are spread out here uh, intermittently all the way uh, along the suture zone, which are also uh, uh, thought to be, or more or less uh, accepted to be the remnants of an intraoceanic subduction zone, uh, which was um, active, we don't really know, was certainly active by 150 MA. The, um, it contains four arc basin sediments and various bits of um, ocean floor that should be um, sitting in a super subduction zone setting. Goes up to 110 MA, although it's associated with an intraoceanic melange that is quite a bit younger up until the earliest um, tertiary time in through here. So if, if we generalize this picture, then we have um, two magmatic arcs, or two, and two um, but this is an entirely magmatic arc, but a um, remnants of uh, subduction zones, an Andean margin to the north, and an oceanic subduction zone to the south. A schematic cross-section across this with uh, Eurasia north on the left here, being we have subduction of one oceanic terrain northward underneath Eurasia, erupting the... Um, the um, uh, uh, Kohistan Ladakh arc, and then we have another subduction, sorry, not Kohistan Ladakh, the, um, the Karakoram Gandhizi uh, Lhasa volcanic arc, and another subduction zone to the south intra oceanic erupting the Kohistan uh, Ladakh arc. So if we can now go forward, uh, if we move off to the east here, we see that the same magmatic. Um, belts of rocks comes around the corner here. Mike Searle mentioned this, the Mokok region uh, coming down through here in Indonesia. So here we see the Andean uh, arc here, and we see this intra-oceanic arc coming down here through the uh, Woyla zone um, all the way down through this portion of, of Indonesia. So now if we generalize this arc, we can see that this whole system extends to the east for a distance which is actually as long as its continuation uh, through, the Him through the Himalaya. And if we look on the eastern side, western side of the Himalaya, we can see here both of these arcs wrap around the corner. And if your eyesight is good from the back, you can see these uh, little red bits here, which are ophiolites which sit in uh, western Pakistan, in this region, continuing this intra-oceanic um, subduction system, or remnants of that subduction system, down through Pakistan. 
down, and this arc continues down through here. We come around the corner, we have the Samile Ophiolite in Oman, and perhaps more importantly, we have the Ophiolites which go in the Zagros, coming through the Middle East, continuing up into um, the, uh, what's basically the Peri, Arabian Ophiolite belt, and then all the way into Turkey through Cyprus, and finally, the last occurrence of this is in the Antalya Naps in um, southern Turkey. So putting this all together now, we have not just a small uh, intraoceanic subduction zone in the western Himalaya, but we can arguably extend this all the way down into Indonesia and all the way into the eastern Mediterranean. So we now have an intraoceanic subduction zone, which is separate from and very different from the subduction zone underneath the southern margin of Eurasia. That's something like 10,000 kilometers in length. There was 10,000 kilometers in length, spanning nearly uh, half the circumference of the Earth. So this Subduction system may be of different ages in different places, but certainly almost every part or every part of the subduction zone looks like it was active by at least 110 million years, so in the early Cretaceous. And so this um, gives us a setting that looks something like this here with this um, intraoceanic subduction zone, which we called the Kishroda subduction zone, the Kishroda Ocean to the north. The Kishroda was the ocean of all good things in Hindu, um, in Hindu mythology. We don't know much else about the paleogeography here. It's possible there was more than one arc in here. There almost certainly had to be a spreading ridge in here up until about 120 MA because we had subduction going in two subduction zones, and yet uh, the rocks down here in Gondwana land were not really moving much with respect to Eurasia. So, um, but we don't know much about the configuration of what that, what that system looked like. What we do know, however, is when various parts of the system became inactive. So if we go from eastern Turkey all the way over here into um, Oman, sort of this uh, transition between the white and the red material, all of this became inactive by being in place southward onto the African-Arabian uh, continental margin by about 80 MA, approximately between about 80 and 90 MA. The same uh, essential timing occurred over here in the Indonesian region where the um, uh, Woyla Arc became uh, inactive at about 80 MA. So at this time, the only po active portions of the arc were this part which is shown in red here, remembering, of course, that we still have the subduction zone going uh, to the north. So if we look at the geometry of what's happening, or uh, begins to happen at around 80 MA, this portion of the interoceanic subduction zone is dead. This portion is dead, and in fact, there's no subduction of an Andean kind uh, at this time either. That also uh, ends. So the only active subduction now is along two subduction zones, dipping to the north, as shown here, and bounded by transform faults, which extend more or less up through these regions in here. So transform, I should say transform-like margins. These had uh, variably some transtension uh, and some uh, trans, uh, transpression localized along them. But more or less the uh, sense of motion was as shown here. So just to sort of make a schematic geometry, the, all these plate geometries that I'm going to show are taken uh, from G plates, which, as Joanne said, has no errors on bars on it, but um, we're just using this for schematic purposes. We had something like this then, where we had this north dipping Andean margin underneath the Eurasian plate that actually had become inactive in this region over in here. We have a north dipping intraoceanic subduction boundary located just in this region through here. Again, we don't quite, really know quite where it is, but somewhere uh, in here. And uh, probably um, somewhat um, localized near the uh, westward extension of the um, intraoceanic subduction zone, where it's now beached itself onto Arabia. So if we plot this general time period when those, um, that intraoceanic arc becomes inactive to the east and west of the Himalaya, we get a picture which looks something like this. So this is the time when those uh, parts are, are shutting down and being emplaced onto the continents. And you can see this is basically at the time or somewhat uh, before uh, the time where the motion of India really becomes very rapid. So our hypothesis then is that 
what, what's happening is that India is moving very rapidly to the north because it is undergoing slab pull from two subduction zones rather than one. So in a sense, you've got two um, subduction engines hooked up here, dry, dragging one plate, a fairly small plate at that, and that that's what is responsible for this very rapid motion of India with respect to Eurasia through this time period here. So that's nearly double the kind of modern rates we see, for example, in the Pacific and in South America. So, um, and we end up with this picture that looks something like that. All right, so this means then that we have a geometry, a sort of little a box diagram as drawn here that looks something like this. So this would be um, uh, Eurasia in the north here, and we have two uh, plates traveling to the north with respect to that. This would be this intermediate uh, Kishroda um, plate being subducted underneath the uh, in, underneath Eurasian continental margin. This would be a plate that is comprised of Indian continental lithosphere. The Tethys oceanic lithosphere, we'll call it that, to the north of India, part of the Indian plate, and newly formed Indian plate being formed in the Indian Ocean uh, down through here. So uh, what we want to do then is take this and quantify the subduction to see if we will get something that looks like um, the very rapid rates that we see in the Himalaya. So I use a semi-analytic model, which we actually tested against a full numerical thermal mechanical um, model for some simple cases, and it um, actually worked quite well. But in order to actually do these calculations, we use this simple semi-analytical model. And what we do is on each time step, we uh, calculate um, the horizontal velocity of the surface plates, and we compute um, the, the regional flow using a Healy-Shaw model that would result from the motion of the plates at the surface. Then we also take the motions of subducted slabs, just treating this as a vertical uh, barrier here, and we take that motion from the last time step and again compute the regional flow using a Healy-Shaw model that would result from the, the motions of the slabs, which includes the toroidal flow of a sphenosphere around the slab. So this third dimension across here actually becomes quite important. And we take all of the stresses which are generated by this regional flow, and in that we embed locally um, the uh, flow systems that occur just above and below uh, the subducting slab. So those are used to set the pressure uh, boundary conditions or stress boundary conditions that we have here and here. And then we basically solve for this, again, using a semi-analytical um, model. And um, the, we, use, have, we compute the viscous stresses acting on the plate, on the top and bottom. We compute the um, normal stress due to the um, load of material in the frontal prism, so over where we don't have viscous asthenosphere in contact with the downgoing plate. We also introduce a shear stress, which you can play around with as you would like uh, on this boundary. And we can use either an elastic viscous or viscoelastic um, plate uh, going down. So of course the basic dri uh, driving mechanism for the subduction is the negative buoyancy of the subducted slab, which varies depending on whether you've got very dense material or very not so dense material uh, going down into this subduction zone. So one of the drivers then is, the, um, is this um, uh, dense material in the subducted slab. We also then compute the viscous stresses as computed from the semi-analytical uh, calculations, the shear stress and the normal stress uh, on the slab. And we put all of these things together and basically time step through uh, the model. And one of the things that we've added um, uh, as compared to what was published a few years ago is that we now do a complete horizontal stress balance on the entire um, system. We can either fix any of the plates or we can require that all the horizontal stresses acting on it uh, sum to zero, including uh, transmission across the plates at the interface along the subduction boundary as well as the um, stress is transmitted by the viscously flowing uh, semisphere. So we have um, basically can um, fix or uh, let remain free any of the plates that we choose. And then finally, although this isn't the point of the model, we added a feature, it's kind of hokey actually, but you'll see we need it later, where we can add some, uh, some compressional stress on the foreland lithosphere that keeps shoving it into the upper plate, and we only need this after the collision, you'll see, and it's not a major feature that I particularly want to talk about or emphasize in this talk, but it made the results look better, so we added um, that feature. So 
Anyway, here, here's our um, model that we want to start out with. Now, the tricky thing is getting basically the initial conditions right, and in some ways we can't do it with the kind of model that we're using here, which is basically just a set of rectangular plates that sit in like this with the foreland plate fixed relative to uh, the underlying uh, lower mantle, because we had this very long subduction zone that kind of turned off uh, with time. So the critical part of this is really what happens um, after about uh, 80 million years. But we do need to start, actually, with um, India in the right place, Eurasia in the right place, India in the right place. We need to generate the right or comparable velocities of India as it moves uh, to the north so that they agree uh, with the observations. We have no idea um, uh, a priori really where this uh, Kishroda subduction zone uh, should be. The other constraints that we need to fit, and this is the kind of modeling I don't like, where you keep running a model over and over again until you get something that agrees with your results. But in this case, we really wanted to see whether we could get anything that looked like the observed um, velocity field that we could get. So then we need to get the collision ages right. And we've done something different from what many people have been doing, although I think that um, people are now reconsidering the ages of collision uh, within, the, within the Himalaya. And my co-author, Ali Agutz, has done some recent work that strongly suggests that, at least in the Western Himalaya, the 50 million year age of collision is not collision of India with the continental margin. It's collision of India with this interoceanic arc, with the uh, Kishroda arc, and that a transect of oceanic lithosphere remained open between Eurasia and India for another 10 million years until that suture uh, also closed. And the data basically come from looking at the um, magmatic rocks in the um, Kohistan Ladakh arc. And what you see here, I put some diagrams up here, everything with an, an um, orange stripe on it is data from the south side of the arc and everything with the, sorry, everything with the orange stripe is from the north side of the arc. Everything with the blue stripe is from the south side of the arc. I'm sure you can't read any of this stuff, but these are the strontium isotopes. This is hafnium and this is uh, neodymium. And what you see is on the north side of the arc, um, for example, if you look in the strontium, you see all values which record basically um, only uh, oceanic material contaminating or being present within the magmas. And then as soon as you hit uh, 50 million years, you begin to see continental contamination coming up as India enters a subduction zone. So this 50, roughly 50 million year age is not controversial. And by the time you're getting uh, magmas up here from the continental margin at 50, probably the entry of the continental material was a few million years earlier. Now, what is more controversial is when you go to the north side of the arc here, and this would be all the things with the uh, orange stripe here, you only see the signature of oceanic material in the arc up until 40 MA when you begin to see the onset of continental um, uh, material coming into the arc. And in addition, the zircons that are contained in these arc rocks, the southern side of the arc, you see Paleozoic zircons from India. On the northern side, by the time you, you start seeing the contamination, you're looking at Mesozoic zircons from Eurasia. So the idea is that we had a tract of oceanic lithosphere um, that remained open after the collision of India uh, with the arc. And this is to remind me to say that actually most of the phenomena that are cited about the age of collision of India with Eurasia can equally well be attributed to the collision of India with this intraoceanic arc. That is, you see subsidence of the uh, Indian continental margin. You see, as I'll show in a minute, you see rapid slowing um, of the subduction. And also, um, hypothetically, we would see changes in uh, what's going on in the Eurasian plate because as you only have one slab pulling instead of two, you have uh, basically less uh, horizontal stress being applied, uh, being applied to this plate here. You could easily expect to see changes in the deformation along the continental margin. All right, so we start here now at 120 MA, where the system looks something like this. We think this was down near the equator because the paleo mag, uh, paleo latitudes that we're getting in through here are equatorial, although um, it's, it, could, it would be nice to have this somewhat uh, better constrained. We come up here now to 80 MA, and it's really from 80 MA on that we um, uh, begin to have a better constrained system that we need to. Um, that we need to be able to model. So I just start something at 130 MA. This almost certainly isn't right in detail, but we know how far um, India was from Eurasia, and it was hooked up to Antarctica, just rifting off at this point. We actually put in two spreading ridges up until 130 MA. We turned one of them off at 130 when we start our model. So this is basically what the, ocean, what the um, ridge morphology uh, looks like. And then we have this very buoyant Indian plate sitting back in here. 
We, um, the problem we had actually when we did this with just these sort of small plates instead of having a very giant plate, the beginning was that we couldn't keep the subduction, um, it was hard to keep the subduction slow enough, and that's why one of the reasons that we had to put this um, uh, spreading ridge uh, in this region down in here. Anyway, that's all whether exactly how that works. Um, is not so important, except that we start off with this rather slow um, uh, uh, motion of India relative to Eurasia, so this goes from 0 to 200 millimeters per year, age across the bottom from uh, 0 to 120. So this is the, age, the uh, velocity of India relative to Eurasia. This is where um, basically those two arcs to the east and west of the Himalaya become inactive. We also turn off our spreading ridge at this point so that we have stress coupled across this entire system from the Eurasian to Indian plate. And at this point, this is when the velocities really increase. Our model velocities get up to about 140 uh, millimeters per year. And the blue circles are Steve Candy's opening of the, uh, of the um, Indian Ocean data. The stars are, I think they're Peter and Joanne's data in here from doing um, the plate circuits. And basically, you can see this is a, mo a moderately good fit to the velocities that uh, you get up in here, except for a small spike right at about 67 MA, possibly that's the reunion plume, I'm agnostic about, um, about that, but that is possible and that's about the right uh, time scale for how long the volcanism lasted uh, in the deck on traps. Here, where we have this uh, vertical gray bar here, this is when India collides with this intraoceanic arc in the model, and we see the rates drop dramatically over a very uh, short time period. If there was no further collision with Eurasia in the model, we would sort of even out at about 85 millimeters per year. But this is uh, the second collision here of India um, amalgamated with the arc, colliding with Eurasia, and we come down here and... Um, if that was all that happened, we would have rates that quickly drop to zero because there's no more slab pull. But instead, um, this is where we do the sort of hokey pushing India from behind here, and we manage to maintain uh, convergence with some shortening of the overriding plate somewhere around 40 millimeters per year. All right, now this uh, diagram here basically um, shows the full convergence rate, which is in the red. It's exactly the same as what you see uh, over in here. And this shows how it's partitioned between uh, the two subduction zones. This blue line here is the intraoceanic subduction zone. Remember, this is a model. This is not at all reality. But the intraoceanic subduction zone here, and much show, slower uh, subduction rates underneath the Eurasian margin shown in the black. And then you can see that as the intraoceanic rate um, uh, drops to zero as India collides with the arc, you can see the Eurasian rate pick up until the second collision when it drops off again. And the reason that's happening uh, when you look at this is that as these two subduction zones are approaching each other, because this intervening slab is being uh, subducted, we get increasingly high pressures in this region in between because we have to cycle material out of this, of this uh, zone and the, the um, narrower this distance gets, the higher those uh, pressures are. And so basically what happens is the high pressure in here actually takes this slab and it pushes it up, it flattens it out, and so um, we get a less rapid subduction here, whereas this slab, the higher pressure actually rolls this into a more vertical position and we get slower subduction occurring, uh, occurring there. So you can see then what's happening now as we turn off this, uh, this subduction zone in here. This one now uh, increases because the pressure back here is reduced somewhat and the slab basically um, uh, uh, falls into a steeper angle and um, subducts faster. All right, so um, basically all we've demonstrated then is that this, is con this idea of having two slabs going at once is consistent with the very high rates uh, that we're getting in the Himalaya. That the dramatic slowdown that we get at 50 MA is compatible with an arc, India arc collision, not necessarily India Eurasia collision. And also from, I keep hitting the wrong button here, it's me and everyone else. Um, and also what we can do is then we can show the model widths of these various oceanic domains. So this would be the model width of the, what we call the Tethys domain in here through time from 120 to zero and starting, this is 4,000 kilometers at the top. And here's this funny plate, the Kishrota plate that we let have a spreading ridge um, uh, in the middle of it. So it, there are two of those, the, the, um, the southern plate and the total combined widths of the plate in here. None of this means much before about 80 MA because of the, um, I think that the model's not completely realistic, but after 80 MA, we are predicting uh, these widths of the various ocean 
domains, so the Tethys Ocean closing from something like 2,500 kilometers to zero, and the Kishroda closing from something like 1,500 kilometers width to zero. And I think these are, these are um, in the right ballpark, that anything you make that satisfies um, all your, your starting geometry and your collision ages is going to yield something like that, with something like 600, 700 kilometers of oceanic lithosphere remaining between the uh, intraoceanic subduction zone and Eurasia at the collision time of 50 MA. So that would be right there. All right, so we can go through then a set of reconstructions informed partly by our model, starting up at 120 as India just begins to remove to move away. No idea if this ridge was up here or down here. There had to be a ridge somewhere. We keep the ridge in here until ADMA when we shut it off, and the only remaining um, a part of this intraoceanic subduction zone is here. We know these transform faults have to be active at this time, and now India experiences double slab pull. We have the collision with the arc here, so this Kishroda plate, we have no idea really how wide it is over in here. It's, um, I think uh, we have a pretty good guess as to its width here in the western part of the Himalaya. And then the final collision, and finally this compressional stress, which shows up in the folds that Peter showed earlier, uh, down here in the central Indian Ocean, being generated possibly partly by ridge push, also I think by the slab pull, which is occurring all the way around the rest of this kind of grossly amalgamated India um, Australia plate, which isn't really a, a plate exactly. Um, okay, so uh, how can we um, test this? This is a model that um, is uh, going to be somewhat difficult to test, I think, but one of the things we can do is we can try to look at the paleo latitudes of the arc rocks which have been erupted or and intruded along this intra-oceanic zone here. So, we've, in fact, we can even do better than that. We could look at the paleo latitudes of the, the um, Andean arc in yellow, which marks the southern edge of Eurasia, and the arc rocks that are associated with this intraoceanic subduction zone. And, in fact, people have done that. And, in general, when they look at things from the um, Lassa Gandesi arc on the Eurasian belt, they get, this is one example from 10 et al., 2010, but they get the paleo latitudes of somewhere around 20 to 30, to, this one is a little bit higher, 20 to 30 degrees uh, north for latest Cretaceous and early tertiary time. In fact, they get this paleo latitude pretty much all the time since um, Eurasia doesn't move very much. Now, this is, uh, these are results from a study which was done um, from the Shigatse four arc sediments, and they get equatorial paleo latitudes of about 3 to 10 degrees south. Fortunately, these are quite old. They're at about 120 MA, so it tells you the arc started out in the right place, but it's not um, young enough to really constrain some of the things we'd really like to constrain about the closing time. So what we did is we took a trip last summer with 10 MIT undergrads, six graduate students, a bunch of Indian students, some paleomagnetists who I think had never been in the field before. Um, it was sort of interesting. Up into the Kohistan uh, Ladakh uh, arc region to date a big a pile of, um, of lavas and ashes that is dated between about 60 and 67 MA, um, depending on, uh, we, don't know, we have ashes in the, in the section that we haven't dated, but other people have dated in that general vicinity, so we know we are constrained by the 60 to 67 MA. So here's our route up over some high passes down into the Panamic Valley, uh, almost to the Karakoram Range. Um, very scenic. This isn't the arc. This is just driving in. We actually almost lost an undergrad. She got serious um, cerebral edema on the trip, but was saved by the Indian military. Um, so here we are, anyway, this whole um, horde of people sampling these um, steeply but very regularly dipping sequences of uh, flows, volcanoclastic rocks, and uh, ash beds uh, in through here. And I was hoping to be able to show you the results of this today, but unfortunately, we have results, but they weren't like fi final enough that the people the undergrad working on them and her advisor didn't want me um, to show them yet, but basically we're getting equatorial uh, latitudes for these rocks between 60 and 67 MA. So what we'd like to do is go in and collect a lot more uh, samples on both sides, the Andean margin and the intraoceanic subduction zone, trying to look for uh, the relatively uh, young age rocks to test whether we can constrain the paleo positions 
of these. But anyway, these are my conclusions from this first and longest part of the, of the talk, which is that we'd had this Cretaceous early tertiary subduction zone. It was about 10,000 kilometers long. After 80 million years, it only existed uh, north of India, and that our modeling uh, shows that it's plausible that these exceedingly fast convergence rates between 70 and 50 can be explained by this double-yoked uh, subduction system. And finally, if we follow this line of reasoning and if some of our inferences are correct, then the slowdown in the convergence at 50 MA is not due to India-Eurasia collision. It could equally well be due to India colliding with this intra-arc system while some uh, hundreds of kilometers of ocean remained open to the north. So the second part and shorter part of my talk that I'd like to talk about is so what happens to, after the collision to all of greater India. So this is a very old diagram after John Dewey, but we see India moving uh, to the north here. And if we color in where India was at 50 MA, this is all the zone of, um, that would remain between India and the Tibetan Plateau at that time period. It's about 3,000 kilometers over here in the east, about 2,000 kilometers in the west. It's an immense amount of continental lithosphere to have gotten rid of. It's a little bit less if we um, know that we have some shortening within uh, the Tibetan Plateau itself. Oops, actually, I didn't quite want to go that far yet. Okay, so here we are now at 40 MA, and because the Indian plate is moving very fast here. That basically reduces um, the amount of continental lithosphere we have to get rid of by something like um, almost 1,000 kilometers. If we kind of very qualitatively thicken up uh, or widen up the Tibet to account for shortening within the Tibetan um, uh, Eurasian lithosphere, which we don't really know what it was, but a factor of 50% to 100% is probably somewhere in the right ballpark. This leaves us about 1,000 kilometers of continental lithosphere that we have to do something with. And this is, Peter, where my question to you came from about adding uh, material on. So where did that continental lithosphere go? Well, this is a tomography map uh, made um, by um, courtesy of Rob Vanderhill's tomography group at MIT at 200 kilometers depth. So here's the Tibetan Plateau. You can see its outlines. This is the four and a half kilometer isoline in elevation right here. Here's India. And so you see this extremely large area of fast P wave speeds in this region uh, in here, which extends from westernmost Tibet um, all the way down to essentially the break between the central Himalaya and the eastern Himalaya. And notice that it extends quite a ways south of the um, Himalayan front as well as north of the Himalayan front. And also note that you have very much less of this area of high or fast P wave speeds uh, in the east. Now we can look at some cross sections through here. And what we see there, so this one is through uh, the western Himalaya, the two through the central, and one through the east. And unfortunately, I didn't put topography on here, so I added where to the plateau was later on. It's this green line. I hope you can see it. But you can see that rather than having a nicely defined subduction zone here, we have essentially a cloud of high P wave speeds. This is the 660 discontinuity. So this thing extends sort of down to um, uh, about 400 kilometers depth, but doesn't really, in uh, this case, extend below it. It's hard to know exactly what this is. Here we have a similar cloud. It looks like maybe some bleed through down into this. This is about 800 or 1,000 kilometers long and about, what, 400 kilometers from top to bottom. In the eastern Himalaya, you have a much smaller cloud of uh, high P wave speeds uh, in here. It's hard to know how it's connected to this, but in any case, it's much less developed than what you see uh, in the western and central uh, Himalaya. And so roughly this would be kind of the area of these clouds that are just kind of floating here uh, in the upper mantle, or that's what one would presume. So we have a problem because India is too buoyant to um, subduct. You can't take down Indian craton or even Indian of any age uh, Paleozoic uh, continental lithosphere uh, into the mantle without doing uh, something dramatic. It's just too buoyant. And one of the ways you can easily see this is that if we just do an isostatic balance between some lithosphere, it doesn't really matter what its composition is, but we just take its surface to be at sea level, which the Indian um, continent almost by definition had its surface at or above uh, sea level uh, in the northern part, or close to sea level. And we compare that to uh, taking an isostatic balance through a mid ocean ridge at about 2,500 meters. We'll forget about the oceanic crust. It's not that important in this, in this instance. What we do is we just take the weight of all the rocks in a column here, the weight 
in a col rock of column uh, in a column here to balance at some compensation depth. You probably all did this as undergraduates here. So you set those two things equal and you rearrange it, and what you end up on one side is just the density difference between average density of the lithosphere and the asthenosphere times the thickness of the lithosphere times g. Okay, so that is plate buoyancy by definition. And on the other side, you see a term. Uh, which is proportional to the depth or the, the, the um, elevation of this area relative to the mid-ocean ridge. So basically anything above the elevation of a mid-ocean ridge, so shallower than that, is buoyant compared to the underlying asthenosphere, and anything below that is negatively buoyant, more or less. And so if the Indian continental lithosphere sits near sea level, it is very buoyant compared to the underlying um, um, uh, mantle. Uh, asthenosphere. So what do you have to do? Well, when we look at these clouds, it looks to me like they must be fairly close to neutral buoyancy. If they were very much denser, like oceanic lithosphere, they would probably go right down at least to the upper mantle, lower mantle boundary, if not into the uh, lower mantle. If they were extremely buoyant, it would be very hard to get them down there. So um, what do you have to do? Well, in order to make these things uh, negatively buoyant, you have to strip off about 15 to 20 kilometers of crust to make them neutrally buoyant. And it doesn't matter what composition you give the Indian craton. If it's near sea level, you ha that's about what you have to do to make it neutrally buoyant. So here is a little cartoon of now we can get this down as a, as a close to neutrally buoyant object by stripping off the upper 15 to 20 kilometers of crust. And where did that crust go? Well, we know that... Uh, a large part of it must have gone into southern um, Tibet, south of the um, Tsangpo suture zone. Here we have a width of something like 200 kilometers of crust that we know was scraped off the Indian plate. This consists of, if we look at a cross section through the Everest region, it consists of sediments that were deposited on the Indian passive margin. It also consists of crystalline uh, rocks, metamorphic rocks, and also their anatectic melts that uh, were part of the uh, Indian plate. And so here, looking at the north wall of Everest, we see uh, uh, material derived from the Indian plate, some sediments on the very top, and um, uh, crystalline rocks uh, underneath. So um, if we think that this object down here is roughly neutrally buoyant continental lithosphere that was, um, has been subducted since the time of uh, collision, we can... Um, we have to worry about a couple of things. One of them is how we get all of this material not only under the Tibetan Plateau, so uh, to the north of where this, uh, this uh, subduction zone is currently, or overthrust zone is here, but also under the Indian plate. Because if you look at sort of a, a simplified diagram of subduction, here's a subducting plate, here's the, the frontal zone of overriding here, and the plate, this plate sits back underneath the overriding lithosphere, not over in here. So two ways you might do this, which end up both basically being the same. You start off with that little diagram we showed here, and then you, be, you begin to override um, the subducted lithosphere, either by shearing off the plate or by bending it or some other uh, combination of things. You continue this process. So in this diagram, we shear off a bit and leave it behind. Here, we just fold the plate over. Um, I don't really um, have a preference as to which one of these things you can do. The first set of diagrams I drew were actually on the left, and people came up to me and said, oh, you can't do that. You can't just shear off the plate. So I, then I made this set of diagrams, which um, is sort of shows the opposite extreme. But in any case, um, you're, I think you're stuck with the fact that somehow you have to deform this downgoing plate, you have to override it, and then you have all this relatively neutral buoyancy material sitting down there here in this cloud, which in this case looks like it's bleeding through uh, into the lower mantle. Now, if we take a very, very simple idea of how much volume is down there. And of course, it's pretty difficult to tell from these tomographic images. Things could spread out and do all sorts of things. But if we just naively stuff some lithosphere, lithospheric slabs about 150 kilometers thick into this, and I hope you can sort of see this, and I've used a combination of these different uh, deformation modes in here to fill these. In the western Himalaya, we've got about 1,000 kilometers of slab can kind of fit into this zone. In the central Himalaya, it's 1,200 to 1,400, again, with large air bars on here. And, but in the eastern part, it's only 500 kilometers of slab uh, fits in there. So um, this looks like it's, it's pretty consistent with the amount of uh, greater Indian continental lithosphere we have to have gotten rid of in the central and western Himalayas. But over here in the east, um, we've got, it looks like we may have a deficit of, um, in terms of how much seems to be preserved at depth. 
And this is particularly a case, like here's the division between where we see this very large uh, zone of high P wave speeds at depth. Here's the much smaller zone. The division line is right there. And if we extend that northward across the plateau, we can see that roughly half the mass of the plateau sits to the east of that. The other half sits to the west. So the question is, first of all, it looks like we must have had some mass transfer in some mode from west to east here. Uh, and then secondly, we need to ask sort of why we don't see more slab over in this region. And um, I think that there are sort of two simple-minded uh, answers to this. So here now we have our uh, projected amount or roughly estimated amount of greater Indian continental lithosphere we need to get rid of uh, from the time of collision. And we could do two things if we want to explain why we don't see slab over, over um, in this region. We could have Tethys ocean floor in this region here and perhaps not have any collision in this region uh, until uh, much later than it occurs in the western and central Himalaya. So that's one possibility. The second possibility is that collision might have occurred at roughly the same time all along the Himalayan front. Let's make that maybe through here. But that we have um, accommodated the northward movement of India in two different ways. Here, we've stripped off the upper crust and subducted um, a neut roughly neutrally buoyant um, lower crust and mantle into the asthenosphere where we see it sitting today. Here, we may have basically absorbed the convergence by ejecting crust off to the south and east so that we accommodate shortening here largely through shortening of the upper plate lithosphere, maybe some of the lower plate lithosphere. So here we are looking at, this is India down here before it's collided with Eurasia. Here's Eurasia over in here, and India is going to swing up and fit right into this uh, little notch in here. Now, so, uh, shortly after the collision, at around 30 to 25 MA, so early Cenozoic, and this is different from the extrusion that Mike Searle uh, was talking about, and I agree with him, there's not a lot of um, motion or offset on the, um, the late Cenozoic faults uh, in this region. But here we have some major shear zones that are active in the early uh, Cenozoic that are related to the extrusion of the Baoshan, the Lamping Simao uh, belt, and Vietnam out in this direction, probably by something like uh, hundreds to 500 kilometer uh, region. Also, this occurs at the same time as we have rollback of this subduction system down here, which is an interesting um, aside. Okay, so if we look in this region here, here are these uh, shear zones. Uh, coming through here, and this is a blow-up of what these, uh, these shear zones look like. These are uh, left-slip shear zones that are accommodating the lateral ejection of all of these fragments out around the corner of the Himalayan syntaxis, which probably was not yet a syntaxis at that time. Here's just a close-up of the actual geology of the region, so you can see these shear zones. A slightly more realistic geometry. They all pinch together here as they come up and go around, um, around the syntaxis. And you probably can't read these ages, but I'll read them to you. These are the metamorphic ages on those shear zones. And they range from about 35 MA to about 15 MA with the higher um, temperature metamorphic ages, so the monzonite ages and things like that, tending to be between about 35 and 20 MA. So um, there are two things that you get from this. One is that it is at least feasible in the geology that we could have absorbed um, hundreds of kilometers of shortening across the eastern um, Tibetan region by ejection of mat material and fragments out of the eastern syntaxis by several hundred uh, kilometers or so. The second thing is that the timing of this with high-grade metamorphism, which means you've already buried things and deformed them and then brought them back up again uh, in order to look at them, being um, as old as 35 MA but not older, that's pretty consistent with the timing of collision of around uh, 40 MA or so. So um, this, again, this is the sort of um, schematic model that you might end up with. I'm not saying that I think it's correct necessarily, but I think it's interesting to consider then that we could have had um, equal amounts of convergence uh, as we go from west to east across here, but that it's accommodated in very different ways in the eastern zone and in the western zone. So the conclusions are up there. You can read them, including the things that um, I was just talking about. But I think the important point is that looking at the tomography here, I think it's best explained as essentially neutrally buoyant lithosphere uh, from the Indian plate that's had its upper crust stripped off. That's, we found that now that's all incorporated into southern Tibet, south of the Sangpo suture. Um, we 
I think that this is neutrally buoyant because it doesn't, um, the clouds sort of are accumulated in the upper mantle. They're not sinking down to the upper mantle, lower mantle boundary, at least not um, in large part. So I think that makes a consistent story. And it also means that we're continually adding material to, um, uh, to Tibet uh, from the south. So I just want to end then by showing this picture that I took, I believe, when I was in um, uh, Tibet with Peter, but I don't remember exactly on which trip. But this is all of Peter and his group, all now working on various aspects of the Himalaya and Tibet, sitting around uh, here and wondering and meditating. And eventually, we all have our different ideas, but eventually we're going to know how all of these things fit together in some sort of coherent way. So thank you.